if we're recording. All right. Uh, hi and welcome to everybody. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will uh, be talking about uh, some um, part of the projects we've been going through over the last few years. Um, first of all, um, if you have any uh, questions, uh, you can raise the hand uh, or you can write it in the chat and we'll try to uh, let you uh, open the mic or uh, read from, from the chat whatever you write to us. Um, and uh, if you have uh, any questions afterwards, uh, our contacts will be uh, at the end of the slide and we'll be sharing the uh, slides to everybody on the email list as well amongst with some other documents we'll be going through uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, I will do a, let's see, maybe I won't. Here we go. Um, so the program we'll try to take you all through is a short intro and then a bit about the project uh, we've been uh, going through over the last uh, few years and then the methods the search method that we have been developing. And then we'll talk a bit about a uh, bit of training facility, how we've implemented that in DEMA at least. And then we'll uh, round off with a bit of a new technology that could help in uh, these sort of uh, uh, missions as well. Uh, my name is uh, Henrik. And I'm Magnus, so glad to see you all. We hope that you will uh, Enjoy the next uh, hour or so, and uh, hopefully you'll take something uh, away from here which can yeah, help you all in your work. Um, we're from DEMA, Danish Emergency Management Agency, uh, the college, uh, where we train incident commanders and crew commanders for all the fire brigades in, uh, in Denmark. Um, bit about myself, I've been in the drone game for a while now and uh, especially for DEMA, I've been developing quite a bit there. And uh, we have a course already, a tactical use of drone that we're uh, running together for the participants uh, in Denmark. And we're both trainers for uh, the EU teams on the uh, EU training exercises called MODEX. Um, and uh, working with legislation work as well uh, here in Denmark. Um, the project itself. Uh, so uh, DEMA uh, looked at the drone area um, and what sort of task we are dealing with. And uh, we have uh, already looked into uh, the fire scenarios of how to use drones there. Uh, but we are also uh, aware, or we became aware that we're using it increasingly for looking for people, uh, missing people. And uh, there was a lot of best practices out there um, everywhere we had our own, which is still being used in DEMA today because what we have developed is so new, we haven't had a chance to roll it out yet. And so we just wanted to get it uh, out so people could start using it. Um, so DEMA at current moment is also using what we have been teaching so far, the best practices uh, that we've been uh, doing, but we will that will be changing into this new method that has been de developed in, in the project. Um, so a bit about the timeline for this. The project has run for three years, but we go a bit further back, just a quick recap. Um, in 2014, 14, uh, DEMA got their first drones and that uh, kicked off the first project uh, in 2016, where we looked at how to use and optimize drones in uh, fire scenarios. Um, and that ran over some few a few years where we did some field tests. We developed this uh, course, Tactical Use of Drones, that we are running. Uh, and uh, in 2021, we uh, managed to uh, publish a textbook. It's in Danish, uh, so it's a bit encrypted, um, but that is um, a, a part of where we have our knowledge from uh, also uh, from the uh, previous projects. Um, during that time, we also helped a bit with legislation work. We helped the Danish police develop their training uh, program. Um, and then in 21, we also started the next uh, project, which is the current one we're here to talk about today. Uh, drones in uh, search and rescue uh, missions. Uh, so we've done a bit of fact finding. 
and some field tests to test off uh, different uh, information we got uh, we gathered uh, a bit more fact finding uh, in the US uh, also attending the unmanned tactical application conference called UTAC uh, and visiting uh, LA Fire Brigade and Chula Vista Police Department as well. Um, and then we uh, last year did some more field tests due to the updated knowledge uh, we have gathered uh, from the first field tests and um, uh, after furthermore of the fact finding we did. And now we've come to a point where we're ready to share. Uh, we've been able to conclude. And so we've hosted a seminar uh, two weeks ago for the Danish uh, emergency management agencies or em emergency agencies and police and, and so forth. And today we are hosting this uh, webinar. Um, so just a recap of the first project uh, where we looked at how to maximize the value of a drone and how to optimize the information flow uh, from the drone down to the incident commander. And uh, if there was a risk of information overlook uh, for the incident commander due to all the information he had to handle. Uh, I won't get into uh, what the results of that was. Uh, it's just a, a recap of what we did look at. The second project here um, was uh, had a few uh, goals, and one of them were to identify uh, identify all the search methods being used at different places uh, to to just uh, get a overall picture of what was going on, what is going on in the world. Um, and also, uh, we wanted to look into how effective is a drone being used for in a search for missing people, uh, both time-wise and how uh, well does it uh, locate people. Uh, we wanted to look at how to ta tactically approach uh, a search mission and how to technically carry it out. Um, and a must, a must, uh, among a few other things as well, but these are the main uh, things we've been looking at. If you have anything, please interrupt. Um, yeah, so that's the current uh, project we are getting to the end of. It does not include, because uh, we had to um, decide where our resources would be put towards, we had to uh, set some barriers in the project. So we, it does not include the cooperation with other units, uh, both uh, dog, uh, dog search teams, uh, other manned search team on the ground, uh, helicopters and so forth. And that was uh, from the point of view that we didn't know exactly uh, how we as a drone unit wanted to work. And before we know what the optimal way of a drone unit is to work, we, we didn't want to look into how to cooperate with other people or other units. And so therefore, we will look straightly looking at how a drone unit can uh, optimize their um, processes. It also doesn't look at other rescue related tasks like, like USAR or things like that. Uh, it was purely looking into uh, missing people in, uh, out and about. We also didn't look uh, into search underwater, um, uh, water uh, rescues. Uh, we purely stuck to the flying drones um, um, in this uh, project here. Also in mountain areas, and for those of you who know Denmark, there's a very good reason for that. We are a very flat country. We do not have mountains. So even if we wanted to, that would have been a challenge. Uh, we have hills and we did look at that. Um, so we didn't look specifically into mountain search and rescue missions. Uh, however, we did find some um, interesting information about that that we will also share later on in, in this presentation. Um, we didn't perform full scale tests at night. We did perform some tests at night, but not full scale in the same sense as we did uh, in daylight. Uh, so we do have some knowledge, but not as a complete uh, knowledge uh, as we do for the day, day searches. Uh, and then we did partial tests with software, uh, not AI, uh, but we did some partial tests with uh, aided software uh, in some of the searches. And we'll get back to that uh, later in the uh, presentation as well. 
Uh, besides that, we have done some additional testing with uh, some both AI software and uh, non-AI software that could help uh, look uh, through uh, search images of missing people. We'll get back to that. Some of the products coming out of this is we did a workshop a few years ago, uh, which one of the uh, products in the project here. Um, fact finding, as we mentioned before, not only in the US, also around Europe. Uh, field tests, quite a few of those. We'll get into those uh, later on. Uh, a method of searching, which is the whole um, nugget of this one, I guess, is what you all want to know about, and we'll get to that one, the method of searching. And then to describe the method of searching, we've also developed some action cards, and we will be sharing those as well. Um, action cards intended for the team deployed, so they can use in the field. A training facility for ourselves here in Denmark, a seminar and a webinar, and of course some new chapters in our already existing textbook, and then on top of that a new course in search and rescue withdrawals. So I mentioned the fact finding a few times now, and uh, some of the facts or some of the data we've been able to gather into this project comes from visiting uh, a search unit from the police, our Coast Guard, uh, Coast Rescue, sorry, um, and our uh, search and rescue helicopter units, and also our National, National Maritime Operations Center uh, here in Denmark, where the uh, Joint Rescue Coordination Center is also placed. Um, then we did some interviews with uh, some uh, of the national uh, drone teams in Denmark. We had an interview with the London Fire Brigade uh, team, Devon and Cornwell in the UK, uh, Hungarian National Rescue Drone Pilot Association. Uh, we also managed to have an interview with them. Again, the workshop with a lot of participants from Denmark. We gathered a ton of documentation from uh, all over the place. Iedo, I have uh, produced a best practice report. Uh, we have got our hands on that. The Danish police uh, had a guide to how they were conducting search with drones. Uh, IENA uh, produced a, a drone efficacy study. Uh, IENA is the emergency European Emergency Number Association. Um, so all the uh, 911, 112 numbers uh, around Europe uh, um, conducted that. Then we got our hands on some search and rescue aerial uh, paper from Search and Rescue uh, in Aerial Association Scotland. Um, interesting, especially for those of you who work in the mountains. And then also a bit of a mountain rescue guide from uh, drones in the UK. We also had a look at the YAMSA manual, which is an old manual uh, for it's a, it's it's for international aerial maritime search and rescue manual. So it's an old book for how to search for missing people uh, uh, in open water with uh, boats and uh, helicopters and, and other sorts of uh, resources. But still the standard. But still the standard, yeah. Uh, and also we from that manual, we also took a lot of lingo and a lot of terms uh, in order to avoid developing and inventing new terms uh, and simply continue using what is already being used out there. Then we also went through the book, uh, Lost Person Behavior, based on the ISRIT database, more than 50,000 searches, um, looking into um, how does people behave when they're lost, uh, depending on their situation and state. And so does I find, and the Grampian uh, is also a document, that they all sort of look into the, uh, how people behave uh, depending on their state. So that's a lot of information um, and you're welcome to look it up yourself. Uh, we try to boil it down and put it into our uh, whole project and research going forth. Then we did our own uh, field tests. Uh, we had four scenarios developed and we ran 18 tests with a total of 180 uh, lost uh, people in, in all those tests and that have given us more than two terabytes of data to work on. I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, we identified uh, 17 search methods 
and eight variations. Uh, I won't be going through them all here, um, but we were able to split them into uh, the search methods into two groups, which were like specific methods and then more general methods. Um, and then the variations is sort of like an add-on uh, you can add to uh, how you fly. Um, uh, so you could add the thermal camera or the regular, uh, the regular red, green, blue camera, RGB, um, live stream and so on. Um, yeah, we'll get back to the methods that included in the actual search method. So we're trying, we're trying to find the, the methods that we find are the most effective and we've kind of included them in the action card and then there will be some of these methods which can have a very specific um, goal and they could be useful at very specific scenarios, but not in a general term. Nobody got hands up or anything, we're good to go. Um, field tests. So this is where we got some of the most crucial data from, uh, where we actually went and we tested some of these uh, of some of these methods of searching uh, and could be able to compare them up against each other simply to see how well does this method compare against this one uh, and so on. And as I said before, a bunch of scenarios. We had a we have a flatland area, a more hilled area, a wetland area and a urban area. We, we already sort of knew that an urban area probably isn't the most optimal um, area for a drone to be used searching for people, but we needed to test it in order to be able to also can say that we can prove that it might not be the most optimal tool. Besides that, uh, the scenarios and, and the tests, during these tests, we also managed to uh, gather data sets that we now can use to test uh, AI or other software. So we now have a data set where we know how well a human team performed on these uh, data. And now we are able to take the same data and feed it into different sort of uh, developed AIs uh, intended for this and see how well does this software then perform against a human team. Um, and um, yeah, there's some interesting results in that. Certainly. So how effective is a drone in a search, um, which is part of the thing we're looking at here? We call it probability of detection, POD. So uh, the POD in this sense here, probability of detection is if a person is in the area where the drone is searching and is visible to the drone. So not in a house, uh, the person might be under a tree where you need to look from a bit of a different angle, that's okay but it's not a person that's completely invisible uh, for a drone. <clears throat> so this search method uh, we've uh, tested out uh, or developed based on all of this provides a POD of roughly 80%, where an average of all tested methods, including uh, the top one, gave an average of 47%. And so that is what we're seeing today around uh, the world being used also here in Denmark. Uh, the current method we're using would, um, on a good day, be providing around 47% uh, POD. So we're happy to see that we were able to improve that uh, with, as the, with the method that we have developed. It takes time-wise, which is also an important factor in this, of course, when you're looking for, for people. It takes an experienced team of two around an hour to search uh, 100 square meters, 100,000 square meters. And that's an area about 350 meters times 350 meters. Uh, often when you do your prep work uh, or a, a drawing on a drawing into the system of your map, uh, your system might be able to tell you how big uh, your area is. Uh, and the 100,000 uh, square meters is a good number for uh, many things in this uh, search method here. Not only that we can tell how long time it will take approximately. Of course, that varies depending on uh, how many people or how uh, difficult the terrain is. But as a rule of thumb, around 60 minutes, 400,000 square meters. Um, 
when you do oh we should get back to this later i'll get back to this uh, talk later because it doesn't make sense to go through right now um the the search method which we which we have named ofs ofs search method uh, is a compilation of the first three letters uh, overview focused and systematic and i'll be going through those uh, those uh, three phases um the tactical approach for search mission is of course that first you need to collect some information uh, information regarding uh, what and who and where you're looking and uh, in our experience it's rarely the drone team that's in charge of the search mission so therefore uh, th they would be given an area by whoever whoever, whoever is in charge of the search uh, mission um, and then divide the area into segments so you have a you are given a search area and you should divide that into search segments preferably in this uh, size of 100,000 square meters uh, and use visual landmarks it's more important that uh, the area is divided according to visual landmarks rather than the 100,000 square meters uh, as they are the a very, way to navigate both for the drone but also for ground uh, teams ground teams and, and other um, personnel that might be be aiding out so it helps a lot uh, through the whole uh, process if you are able to divide it in according to visual landmarks um, and saying this uh, we recommend that one drone team or search area could be around 400,000 square meters if you are able to place your uh, TOLA as we call it take off a landing area if you're able to place that somewhere central in the whole in the whole area you can cover 400,000 square meters and then you can divide that into four uh, segments and then you have around these 100,000 square meters per segment and then of course you should uh, work uh, out from the OFS search method long, uh, <laughs> think a bit long term when you get into a task like that it, like a task like that sorry is a uh, thing about replacement or breaks for the search team for the drone team um, after approximately four hours it was our experience uh, that the teams and people start uh, getting a bit uh, incorrect in going through the images looking at the live stream uh, more errors were made we call it uh, picture blindness uh, and after four hours uh, it sort of became a critical point where uh, people would make more and more mistakes. So therefore, uh, we recommend that uh, a rotation or a break uh, after four hours. So the first phase uh, of the search method, overview flight, the phase one. Overview flight uh, consists of two parts. And the first part is an overview rotation. An overview, overview rotation is uh, where you simply fly, uh, lift the drone off the ground, fly up into probably your max uh, uh, flight altitude. In Denmark, it's 120 meters. Uh, and then you perform a rotation around uh, the, uh, uh, the drone itself, just looking out in the area. Um, you're not actually looking for people at that point because that method is not very good for identifying people. But it is good for identifying your search area is there any um, hazards for the drone uh, electric wires uh, hung over uh, or um, a windmill or a mast or something else that could be uh, a, a danger to the drone and also the environment is there a lake is there some uh, place where it divides on tracks and so forth so your overview rotation is mainly for gathering information regarding your flight Second part is an overview route, uh, and the overview route is a, a easy to start uh, task. So you have your uh, whole search area, not just the uh, segment, but the whole search area, and you start out by performing what we call a perimeter search. So you're flying, you fly along the perimeter, 
of your whole search area. And once you perform the perimeter search, uh, you do a sort of like filling out the gaps uh, in that area. You do that in a lower altitude than the, the first part. So you probably reduce your fly, fly height to like 60 or 70 uh, meters uh, above ground level and, and perform your flight there. And uh, this is not a complete search. You're not supposed to do a full on uh, search of the whole thing. It is what we uh, call a quick and dirty, uh, quickly see is there anything fast we can uh, spot just simply to save time uh, if, uh, if that is a very essential thing. So quickly just get out there and, and do a quick search of the area. Uh, not too thorough, but uh, somewhat uh, enough that you uh, will have a chance to, to catch a, a thing that would pop up. Another thing you do in the overview route flying around in your search uh, area is um, identifying spots of interest uh, for the next phase. So that could be, uh, I'll get to that, identifying spots for the next uh, phase, which we'll get back to what that could be. The piloting command task is to fly the drone and the technician, which is what we call the second person on the drone team, watches the live stream uh, on a preferably big TV in order to get the pixels up in a size where a person is not just uh, this big, but might actually be uh, this big. Um, so that is the task sharing between the two uh, on the team. Let us know if you have any questions or write them down and we'll take them at the end. Second phase is called focused search. So here we look into uh, also two parts. First part is what we call risk search. So when you do your overview route, you are also looking for risk spots, uh, places that could be dangerous to the person. Uh, water, um, cliffs, places where you can fall down, or even just a wet patch where a person with a bad leg or an illness could uh, fall around and lie in some wet water and be chilled uh, could be dangerous to a person. Um, and then probability search, places that would make sense according to the person. So when you fly around in your overview route uh, and identify those, especially if you have uh, the laser pointer option where you can set some POIs, uh, you fly around, set them, and then you can back, get back to them once you're done with the, the first phase and move on to this one. In probability search, which is a bit of a difficult one uh, to um, navigate in and uh, determine, you have to look at the person's uh, profile. And uh, that's where you look at the, the book, uh, Lost Person Behavior, the document I find, or the Grandkin document, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other out there as well. Uh, and it becomes a bit of a work. What Lost Person Behavior have done is they have developed an app um, that allows you a bit quicker to look up the information that you might want. So here they have a wizard and you choose simply uh, whatever uh, category you are in or multiple if you are looking in a multiple or combined scenario and it will choose for you which one is the most important according to where you should be looking. So here we'll be looking into, in this example, we're looking into the mental state of a person. And then you go into the next part where you simply choose what sort of mental state does the person have. Um, and there's a bunch of different uh, options down this list. We chosen uh, to go with the dementia uh, in this uh, scenario or in this example here. And what you get into here, there is uh, in the top uh, three, uh, four different um, fans, uh, profile, plan, search, and some stats. And all of those provide you with different information that you could use to determine where a person would be lying uh, or searching towards uh, and what other sort of um, considerations you should have made or should make for this type of person. Uh, it also gives you uh, good uh, facts on based on stats. So it's important to remember it's stati statistics, a lot of it, and therefore you need to think outside the box yourself as well. But this is a good way to incorporate st statistics into your search. 
Uh, and here in this case, if you want to hit the 50% mark uh, of looking for people where half of uh, people would be uh, within, you would uh, have to have a search uh, um, radius of uh, 1.6 kilometers. Uh, and there's a bunch of other stats uh, when you're looking through this. It's not a free app, so you would have to get permission to spend a bit of money on that. It's not too expensive, but it's not free. It's fairly cheap. It's fairly cheap. Um, and again, in this phase, the pilot in command flies the drone and the technician watches, watches the live stream. These two phases take about 10 minutes each at least for a segment of 100,000 square meters. Um, so they are relatively fast to go through, um, is the intention of them. So if they, if you find yourself spending an hour in one of these uh, phases, uh, you might be conducting your search um, not wrong, but not according to how uh, we want to optimize the time versus uh, POD. Last phase is what we call systematic systematic search. And here we simply go into mapping of the segments. So each segment get a good old uh, mapping mission uh, as uh, if you have uh, tried that before, you know what that, uh, what that, how that works. The, the drone calculates the, um, the route itself based on a drawing you put in or uh, the parameters you put in, and then it flies and uh, collects a lot of images. Um, and you do that one one time for a segment, and it's important to uh, split it up. Uh, we'll get back to that. So here, one person maps, the other person does image processing. Image processing means that once you've done a, uh, a one of these mappings, you take the images out, put it in a computer, and then uh, you sit and go through uh, these images. And then while you do that, the other person can fly another sector, a segment. And then you sort of swap. Um, and what we found to be the most, um, the best way of doing it is that actually the person who flies an area also go through uh, his or her own pictures. Uh, even though you might think that a pair of fresh eyes uh, would help, it, it was better that it was the same person who had already flown who were going through the images again. Uh, and it is important here that you rotate jobs, uh, simply again to avoid uh, or prevent uh, this picture blindness that can occur. And a segment of about 100,000 square meters give you around uh, amount, that amount of pictures that you are able to handle before you get into, again, um, a mode where your brain subconsciously get a bit of picture blindness and you see the information, but you don't register it and you just move on in your whole process. So it's important to rotate jobs or get breaks in between these, both for the person looking at live stream, but also for the person looking at the uh, images. Doing this image processing here gives an additional 21% fines. So um, often what we run into is that people experience that, well, we already flown over the area, we've seen what is there, um, and we can now move on. They, we might, we, we'll just be wasting time going through the images we've collected. Uh, it's much better just to push on. But going through those images, a you can say second time, provides additional 21% a chance of finding someone simply because the quality is better uh, and uh, all the other factors that comes into looking at images on a screen. And then it's important to use the correct search settings. And um, now I will be going back to the slide I was skipping before. So what is the correct search settings? That might depend on your system. So we have developed a document that could help you determine the search uh, settings for your system. Bear in mind, this is if you conduct a human search or a human uh, image processing. If you do, if you're using software to conduct that, you might need other search settings. 
These search settings is if you are using humans to go through the pictures. So first of all, you need to determine uh, what your altitude is. How high should you fly? Uh, and um, we'll be sharing this document as well. It is a PowerPoint. Uh, and on the second slide next to this one here that is described to you how to do it, you would find this whole picture down the bottom with the grid on, allowing you to take a picture or a few pictures with your own drone, imp uh, import it into the uh, PowerPoint and push it backwards. And then uh, in that, that way, determine if you're flying too high or too low, or if you're in about the right height uh, flight altitude. Second test is your camera angle. Um, and one thing that's also helping uh, preventing uh, image or uh, picture blindness is uh, not looking straight down because you are apparently, for some reason, people are not used to walking around looking straight down, uh, seeing things from above. So it helps to get a bit of perspective of things, uh, another perspective, and therefore tilting the camera uh, is a is a good factor to help prevent picture blindness. Um, and what we came to a conclusion was that if you have uh, a spot uh, below, uh, directly below the drone uh, and you have that in the bottom part of your screen, you prop, you have a, you, then you're about right with the angle. That provides you with the correct angle, looking straight down to be able to spot if somebody is between two uh, objects uh, and not get them in a blind angle, but also get a bit of perspective if people are hiding under a tree cone or uh, uh, whatever it might be. Then, of course, how much overlap do we need doing this mapping mission here? And um, what we found is too many pictures, again, increases uh, chance of picture blindness and therefore uh, making the search uh, less effective. So therefore, um, what we saw was a good um, balance was when an object appears in the frame nine times. Uh, so that means uh, three times uh, moving from left to the right in the picture and also from top to bottom. And um, that provides a object nine times in the course of a mapping at least. And then of course you need to make sure that you leave a mark and margin, a small margin for the drone to sway a bit or whatever it may be. So at least uh, nine times uh, is is a mapping overlap you should have. Um, with when it comes to open water, it's a bit different because you don't need to have covered yourself from those blind angles that can occur. So therefore, four times in total uh, of a grid is is uh, is all right in those uh, scenarios. That saves you time and images. Then, of course, you need to figure out how flash, fa fast you should be flying. Um, and there are uh, sort of th uh, three different speeds you should try to uh, test your way out of. One is your RGB camera in uh, broad daylight. Then there's your RGB camera in low light. So that's like in the morning or in the evening, or if it's really dark cloud, because that reduces how fast you are, are able to fly and still get somewhat clear images. And the last one is for your thermal camera. Skip forward again. So, all these different phases of the method, how do they add to the whole productivity of getting a person found? Because um, we are aware that sometimes speed is uh, can be more important than getting a high uh, POD. Uh, so what you have to your left side uh, is the um, POD and on the right uh, the right side is the minutes uh, it takes for the whole uh, process. And after 10 minutes uh, for, a, for an overview flight, you have a probability of detection about 28.5%. Adding another 10 minutes to that, and you perform your focused search. And then you add 13% uh, to that, and you get about 40% uh, of POD. And this is where 
it's really up to uh, the search leader determining, well, is it important for us to gain speed of a bigger area or do we want to get a more correct uh, or bit of, a bigger POD of this, uh, a small area in the same time? Because then it jumps. Then after 40 minutes extra on that, you have spent an hour and uh, then you've done this systematic search. Uh, it adds about 37% uh, POD to your search, and you get a combined uh, POD of about these 80% uh, using the OFS search method, as I was saying in the earlier slide. The systematic search uh, right now is only using a parallel sweep search, so sort of like a snake uh, search. If you want to swap that out for a grid search, so you do both one direction and the other direction, you add another 40 minutes to your search simply due to the amount of data you're getting and the flight time you need to uh, add on to it as well. But you only gain roughly 7% extra POD uh, adding your grid search. But that is still upping your POD if that is what you uh, are aiming to uh, go for in a certain area. No questions so far. It's all good. Either you all fall asleep or <laughs> you're just very patient. So we appreciate it. Um, action cards. As I promised, we've also uh, developed uh, these action cards uh, helping the uh, people being deployed uh, to just to have a place to quickly look up uh, what to be aware of uh, and, and remember. And um, it contains a bit for initial search planning, a general of the uh, OFS search method, a bit about flat environment, hill terrain, wet terrain, urban environment, uh, night time flight, technical considerations, and then some shared and common language uh, to optimize the workflow, uh, not only in the team, but also with other uh, uh, partners um, in the task. So I'll just quickly run through uh, some of them. The initial search planning uh, gives you input to what sort of information to uh, ask for and get for your briefing prior to start, um, about the person, about where they last been seen, direction, uh, and so on. And also what's, what's your uh, search area you're being given. And it says here 300 to 400,000 square meters. Uh, so that is the size as you that you as a drone team could uh, safely tell them that you could handle in one go. Um, and then we move to the next part, planning to start, uh, planning prior prior to start. Um, that is breaking down your area into these search uh, segments and, and drawing them onto the map uh, to help you um, keep that in mind, and uh, so on and so forth. A bunch of different points to remember in that, and then other uh, deployable, uh, deployed resources, resources uh, to remember to ask uh, what else you might be uh, meeting out there. Then we come uh, to a short uh, or a summarized version of the uh, OFS method here, uh, which we've done, just gone through, so I won't be going through it again but it quickly just states how long each uh, phase uh, take and how uh, big of an um, area that is for. Then for all the different environments, there is a bit about strengths to that environment, limits, pitfalls, technical considerations and tactical considerations. And that is for each of the different and um, four different environments that we have uh, tested in, or in five actually, including the nighttime. The technical uh, is a page where you can put in your search settings that I was talking about before. So once you've determined your search settings uh, that is for your system and the sensor specific sensor you're using, you can put it in your action card so that you remember those settings uh, or your team has a chance to remember what the settings are when they are in the field. Um, and then a bit of common language here and how to uh, to could to uh, potentially establish some sort of common language with 
uh, other search parties that are attending. Then what we also saw was the value of these POI, uh, POIs that uh, a laser pointer can put uh, on your uh, map when you're flying the drone. They present a, a huge value to your search. Um, but it does become a bit messy if you're not careful and having a system on how to navigate in them. And so we also try to um, come with a suggestion on how you potentially could integrate uh, colors uh, as a part of your way of organizing uh, your whole search digitally or in your uh, search uh, system. And that was it for the action cards. Then, um, let me see, our time is running real fast now. Uh, as I promised a bit about, uh, a bit more for the mountain rescue uh, teams out there, uh, there's a website called uh, rescuemagazines.com. I have a link here and it will be in the shared site as well. Issue eight and nine, there's an article about using drones in mountain rescues. And a lot of, a lot of good pointers uh, that we've also taken uh, uh, for inspiration. Um, so if you're in an area where you have mountains, you might have benefits going in and looking at, at this uh, article here. When I uh, looked at the website recently, it was free. Um, so it might still be. Hope so. Uh, otherwise, you might have to purchase it. And then I will uh, let Manus talk about our new drone and train facility. Yeah. So a part of this uh, project we've been running on uh, how to use or how to utilize drones in, in search and rescue missions. Um, we had the opportunity of visiting the, the UTAC course uh, in the States, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, a go at this uh, bucket training. Um, so uh, we pretty quickly became fond of the idea. Um, it's a method uh, developed by NIST, um, a, a government organization in, in the US. Um, so I'll try to just quickly run through what it is, uh, how it works, uh, and why we've been adapting it, um, and what we've been trying to adopt into our training facility at the DEMA College. Um, so it's a bucket training uh, method. You get these. Uh, Bucket flowers, um, and it's been developed by National Institute of Standards. Um, so basically, it's all math um, and geometry, um, and it's been put into a, a certain um, a standard so that you can come back and have the same uh, flight over a, a certain pattern, um, and you get points and a time for each flight, and in that way you can track your uh, your proficiency uh, and your skills um, and you can do the same with your with your drone team uh, so you can begin to kind of make a barrier of uh, how how good a certain pilot needs to be before you uh, take them on into the actual uh, um, tasks in real life um, what we have seen is that it looks somewhat funny um, maybe even worse than that um, but after trying uh, just one flight, we were um, pretty ready to uh, adopt the system. Um, so uh, we took it back home um, and have been starting uh, implementing it into the DEMA College. Um, it cannot stand alone as a training facility. So it's uh, primarily uh, training uh, your finger uh, eye coordination, uh, your use of the drone. Uh, manually and not so much the tactical part of the uh, of the flying, um, but our uh, theory is that the better a pilot is to fly the drone, the less energy they use for for the actual flying, and they can then spend their mental uh, energy on uh, on the tactical uh, considerations and and searching for the person. Um, so that's kind of our hope that we can uh, train some better. Uh, uh, Practical paddles, which will then be better at at the tactical considerations too. Um, so the general idea is uh, it's made out of uh, yeah white and uh, black buckets, 
plastic buckets um, placed on these uh, very simple uh, wooden structures. Um, and inside the buckets, you have these uh, circles. Um, I guess they come here. So each uh, bottom of the bucket has these uh, five rings uh, plus a colored ring. So depending on how good the pilot is uh, at commanding the aircraft, uh, looking straight down into the bucket, you get points for uh, uh, how many of these broken lines you can you can see. So you kind of have to think like a compass. So uh, for the example on the screen, the the first bucket uh, line has been broken uh, to the to the left side, and then it will be bottom left and top left. Um, and even on our screen, it's hard to see the next lines. So it's a challenging uh, task, both for the pilot, but also for the for the drone equipment. So you can kind of see the development on how good is the cameras, uh, how good is the sensor um, becoming um, added on. Um, the small picture here from the clipboard uh, shows how there's these uh, defined uh, flying patterns. Um, and that gives you kind of a bit like when you're taking a driving test, you need to go through certain uh, tasks. Um, and then at the, at the finish line, you will have a kind of like a benchmark um, for, for, your, for your skill set. Um, we have shown that we have a video link. Uh, we will include that in the mail, um, else we will be running out of time very quickly. So. Um, but it's an open source uh, um, um, uh, system, so um, we will include a link to to NIST too, and then you can have a, when you visit their website, they will have a, a construction manual like uh, going into IKEA and buying a simple closet, um, and they will have uh, the files for all the uh, both the clip bar, clipboard um, schemes and all these uh, circles uh, to put into your box. Um, and even though it seems uh, very simple, it's um, at least for our consideration, it's uh, very modular. Um, so you can use it both for a kind of very simple uh, flight uh, proficiency uh, training, but also for advanced uh, flying, like for example, flying indoors with the, the smaller drones or having uh, recon missions on around cars, for example. Um, so we'll just uh, skip through a quick selection. So this is a drawing or a picture uh, combination of our, uh, or at least part of our training grounds. Um, and just try to uh, uh, illustrate how we would like to, or how we are planning and building uh, our uh, NIST training course at the moment. Um, so in the top right corner here, uh, we've been um, setting up some, some shipping containers. Um, the NIST uh, standard is built uh, to fit into uh, these shipping containers, which are fairly uh, popular around the uh, fire training facilities. Um, and then we will uh, have the possibility of, of training several pilots at the same time, uh, but also with uh, fairly simple materials, we'll have a lot of different uh, opportunities uh, of training in, in both uh, different sizes of drones, uh, but also different levels of uh, uh, of skills um, at the pilots. Um, so very interesting to see. Uh, we're not all finished yet, but uh, we're getting close to it, and all looking forward to uh, trying it ourselves too, um, and putting our colleagues to the to the test. Um, yeah, as we promised, we'll uh, try to share a little bit about the new technology we have uh, seen too. Uh, it will be primarily uh, software based, what we have been, uh, uh, or at least what we will be talking about today uh, in the last uh, few minutes. Um, so we will, uh, and we have taken the, the programs with us, which have uh, given us a, a, either a possibility of testing or which we have seen benefits of. Um, so some of you may know uh, DJI Flight Hub 2, uh, which is this. Um, combined uh, management platform, uh, DJI supports, uh, which can uh, make your uh, drone and your controller and, and your computer uh, talk together. Um, and 
like Henrik mentioned, these uh, points of interest uh, can be shared, um, which becomes very effective. Um, so, for example, if you want to share the, posi uh, the position of a um, of a of a find, uh, it could be a um, a person you have uh, found, or it can just be something which needs to be checked out by uh, by ground crew. Um, then you can kind of uh, add that task to someone uh, at the at the computer and have the pilot uh, keep working. Um, it gives you the possibility of uh, light mapping. So if you're working on very large areas, you could benefit of having a map uh, function uh, or a maps uh, updated uh, in the beginning. Um, so generally just a tool that makes your work uh, easier and uh, um, and safer even, um, and gets the cooperation between uh, several drones uh, more proficient too. Um, then we have uh, been in contact with the, um, the company Techstar, which has done this uh, program called Ediat. Um, and they are a, uh, or the software does image uh, processing or uh, image uh, work through. Um, and we have uh, been running it on a low end computer, uh, so like a standard office uh, laptop. Um, and Henrik, maybe you can explain how uh, how the program has uh, been running. Uh, so this program, so this is all this software here, uh, or at least uh, the next few ones, is is minded towards the last phase of the OFS. Yeah. To we've been looking at this going through images is a heavy process and a heavy task, and if we are able to outsource it to a program uh, that could do it better or as good, uh, we could uh, do things much faster and save a lot of time. So Adia uh, can do that. Uh, and uh, we were given it free. I'm not sure what the price is, if it's a sale or if it is a free software, uh, but we were we were given a free uh, version or trial. And uh, it basically looks for colors. So uh, you feed it with a bunch of images and you define a color and you give it a range plus minus uh, of how fixed it should be on that color. And then it goes through all the images very quickly. So if you know that the person you're looking for is wearing a red jacket, you can put in the red and then uh, it should uh, it try to locate red in all those images, uh, a red that stands out. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit difficult because there's a lot of colors to choose from here. Uh, and so we weren't able to determine a POD or an average time per segment using this software simply because it was very user uh, input based. So uh, we could run with one type of uh, red and another type of red and it would give different results. So, and and there was a lot of colors to choose from, pretty much that whole color wheel, you know, when you're trying to select a, a new color. So uh, that's why we weren't able to say that we could uh, provide a POD on average time for this uh, software here. As a comparison, we tried uh, the program called Locate. Uh, if you have uh, yeah, been <laughs> online in some of the drone forms, you might have heard about it. Uh, again, we have been running it on a low-end uh, office desktop uh, laptop. Um, again, we've been given a, a free trial. Um, and uh, it looks uh, like this when you get the program open. Um, similar to Adiat, it's looking for colors, um, but Locate has the possibility of, of um, making a broader search, you could say. Um, so it makes it a little bit more user friendly um, and you could search for, um, for colors even without knowing uh, what your missing person is wearing. Um, so it's, it's more or less looking at the colors which is not found in natural environment um which uh, when we heard it at least sounded a little bit funny but it seems to uh, to have some um, some good uh, benefits um it gave us a pfd of, of 24 percent um and uh, average time of, of 16 minutes per, per segment um locate does a thermal uh, program too which we haven't had the opportunity of trying yet um and you can see the price here. So 
around 700 uh, US dollars uh, a year. Um, this is the only software we found that does a thermal um, yeah. scan as well. It doesn't look for colors in the thermal, it looks for the actual underlying uh, uh, data in the pictures, um, is, is what we've been told, but we haven't been able to test it. So if you had that function in, you might be able to produce a higher probability of detection with this software. Yeah. Um, so here is, is shown uh, what, what the program is looking for. It's kind of looking at the peaks of colors, which is uh, not typical for the, for the natural environments. And that will then give you uh, your drone pictures and, and an indication of where the program has found uh, uh, this, this color. Um, so for some of them, of the pictures, it was uh, uh, very effective. Um, yeah, here yeah, close up what the what the drone has found uh, or what the program has found. Um, and then when you have uh, been looking through all the pictures that the program has found, you can uh, kind of uh, tick the box for uh, the pictures where there's an actual found uh, find, and then it will give you this uh, map function and show you where the the pictures with the finds are um, um, are located, and then you can. Uh, yeah, go out and, and retract your uh, your missing person. Um, then we tested uh, the program EVI scan uh, again on a low end computer. Um, a much higher uh, probability of detection, at least in our uh, testing set, uh, 71% or close to 72, uh, using around 10 minutes per, per segment. Um, it's still a beta program, uh, so there's no pro, uh, no cost uh, or no price um, at the moment. Uh, what the program is doing, it's looking for um, abnormalities or uh, something which stands out, um, and that means that, for example, in uh, places with a lot of people, they won't. Uh, the program will not find anything. Uh, so it needs something that that stands out in the in the frame. Um, and when the, the program has been running through your pictures, you get this uh, mosaic of, uh, of small zoom-ins, and then you can kind of uh, point out which uh, pictures are interesting for you. Uh, so if you are watching this webinar on a, on a big screen, you can probably see that we have a person uh, uh, on the one side there in a uh, red uh, blouse or something. Um, then lastly, we've been uh, testing the program SAR UAV, and that's the only program of the four which is using uh, artificial intelligence AI. Uh, it needs a, a powerful computer, so we've been running it on uh, on like a gamer uh, computer and a gamer laptop. Um, it can do more than just uh, looking through pictures. It, like the top picture here shows that it can calculate uh, search areas depending on uh, on the geography. So it will give you kind of an indication on, on how far a certain person can go uh, within uh, time frames. So for example, I guess this one has uh, set the time for two hours and that will give the, the yellow uh, line here. Um, we haven't tested that part. We have only tested the, the part which looks through pictures, which is uh, the bottom part down here. Um, so you will feed the, the picture set into the program um, and you will have to uh, identify where you have had your, your total place, uh, your takeoff and landing area. Um, and from that, it will then place all the pictures on the map and it will start looking through the pictures. Um, the benefit or there's many benefits from, from this program, but you can, uh, you can look through the pictures while it's working. So as soon as it's found, a uh, um, a hit or a, a potential hit, uh, you can start looking at the picture in the bottom corner, and then you can indicate whether it's uh, something interesting or if it's a uh, if it's nothing like a false. Um, and then at the end, you will uh, have a uh, an indication on your map whether you where you found something. Um, so what we have seen uh, is a probability of detection on uh, eighty eight percent, so uh, uh, pretty effective too. Um, and fairly uh, quick too. 
we are running on a on a faster computer now, but around six minutes per per segment. Um, we don't know the pros, uh, the price. Uh, you will have to uh, write to the to the company. Um, they will define the the price depending on what type of uh, company and area you are you're looking for the program at. Um, and then this program is is you could say a little bit more. Um, yeah. So when when you have found something, you can uh, then um, share QR codes with your uh, found positions. So uh, the person down here would potentially be uh, colored in one of these pictures. And then when you finished, you can then uh, send an email to your your teammates or uh, with a QR code for uh, the GPS uh, positions, um, which seems to work very well. Um, so very quick uh, and and fairly uh, this safe too. So this, this is definitely uh, fast and effective, but it is also the one that requires the most expensive uh, hardware and uh, the most expensive uh, price for uh, itself. The program itself, yes. Um, yeah. Um, lastly, we have been uh, introduced to to another way of searching for people. Uh, so instead of uh, visually looking for people, you can start looking for their uh, mobile phone or their cell phone instead. Um, so what we have uh, been met with is these two companies. So one called Echo and the other one is LifeSeeker. Uh, I'm sure there's others out there. Um, and they are uh, like a, a mobile phone uh, signal scanner, um, which you can uh, plug underneath your drone. And then by flying in, in uh, uh, patterns, you can then uh, triangulate uh, the signal from your uh, missing person uh, oh. or yeah, from the phone. Certainly it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, be the same place as the person. Um, it needs some uh, information about the phone, so you cannot, you can't just search uh, uh, for random phones. Uh, you need to the EMI code for the phone uh, before you start searching. Um, it can potentially make a communication with the phone. So even if you are in an area with no uh, cell service, uh, you can uh, establish an, a communication with the phone. Um, yeah, very clever too. If you're, uh, I was about to say, if you can watch uh, television in, in Scandinavia maybe, uh, there's a, a demonstration in a, in a television program about the Norwegian uh, rescue helicopters. Uh, it's called Red um, in the episode seven. It's maybe a little bit more. Uh, uh, yeah, it's easier to see how it works there uh, than our um, explanation. Uh, yeah, so far so good. We hope that you are all still alive. Um, if there's any questions, I guess we will uh, be ready to uh, to answer. Um, Absolutely. Both in the chat and if you can uh, yeah, raise a hand or. Uh, Stop sharing, maybe. Yeah, somebody uh, here. Uh, just a moment. Too so it's Peter. Just yeah. let me screen here. We will unmute. So, so now you can. We allowed your mic, but you need to unmute yourself. Okay. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I was. Curious about the effect of training on the human spotters. So, like, um, do you find that people can learn to be more effective spotters? And do you find that this is a potentially kind of confounding factor on experiments if somebody is kind of switching um, switching methodologies, but they also are getting better at spotting things over time? Uh, absolutely. Uh, a a bit. A big thing we found was that it definitely requires training to be looking through uh, the images and the streams and the data that you get. It's not only about getting trained in the system and being able to fly the drone, 
but certainly also training in looking for people uh, is is a part of improving uh, the results of uh, of your team or the effort you, you you get from it. Does that reply your question? If I answer your question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I guess my small follow up would be just when people are training to look through images, what what do they learn? Like, what is the thing that they learn that makes them better at looking through them? So I, that's hard to tell. I think it's it's uh, just um, a way of learning how to uh, understand the pictures you're looking at. Like, what does it mean from the angle and the perspective? Uh, getting some sort of like repetition of um, the task is, is simply the improvement, uh, learning how things look from the angle you're looking from um, and uh, what to be aware of um, is what seemed to be what makes the difference. Thank you. I think there's a second factor too. Uh, so from what we have seen is that uh, you need to be uh, in a quiet environment without uh, distractions without people coming and asking questions uh, and that goes both for uh, when the uh, when the technician is looking at the big screen uh, but also when you are scrolling through the pictures at the at the last phase uh, the s phase uh, so if you can kind of isolate yourself um, then it will well, your your search will benefit from it too any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. Oh, we got one here. Oh. If no one else is asking, I have more questions too. Yeah, yeah. We'll let you go first, and then uh, we have Chris afterwards. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, if I'm going, then um, uh, often you have very high resolution images from these drones. Um, did you guys develop kind of a best procedure for scanning through them? I, I find like you often have to do a manual grid search through the image itself uh, when looking at it by eye. Uh, did you find something best for when you have, say, a um, a 50 megapixel image or something like that? I, I think what we've kind of uh, done is, is maybe this um, PowerPoint uh, document where you fit your, your, your pictures into um, to try to get you down in a height or a flying height, which uh, makes sure that, that a person will get a certain size. Um, so even with very large um, sensor uh, cameras or very large files, um, a 24 inch screen will only be 24 inches. Um, so very small people can, can be very hard to detect even though the res resolution of the picture is very high. Um, that could potentially change when you start using uh, AI or, or these uh, software um, aided uh, uh, technician uh, techniques. Um. Okay, thanks. Right, now we'll unmute Chris, or allow your microphone at least, and then you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you both. Um, it's it's uh, not so much a question, um, more a comment. I just wanted to congratulate you on the um, the effort that you put into this. Uh, this is something that we're working on quite a lot over here. Sure, um, uh, for your input, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no this is this is way beyond anything like that this is um this is fantastic and um certainly a, a lot that i'll be taking away from this um but yeah no uh, i just want to congratulate you some some really excellent work and and i thank you for your efforts which i will be using some of so thank you very much thank you thank you very much well that was nice even <laughs> though it wasn't a question it was very nice can't uh lie there um, it doesn't seem like we have any more. Yeah. No. Do Do you have another question, Peter? I can go on all day, but I also want to second what Chris says. I just see a, 
I see teams all over kind of making ad hoc methods, which is good because it encourages experimentation, but it is really nice to see a good, well thought out, experimented upon database standard operating procedure that people can follow if they want to. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I think we will conclude uh, this uh, webinar here. Um, I will certainly stop the recording now.